So uh, I guess uh, I had read Morris's book, uh, Season for Justice. Um, and I, I was so impressed with Morris Dees, my goodness. He was, he was the real deal and, you know, I would never be the real deal. Um, and certainly never be uh, an equal or, or someone that would uh, uh, know Morris Dees or have, have Morris Dees affection. And so uh, I get this call. This has got to be 2006 or so. I get a call. Uh, and my secretary says, uh, Morris D is on line one. And I went, yeah, right. <laughs> and I said, I don't have time for this foolishness. Tell them I'll call them back. She said, no, I think, I think this really is Morris D's. <laughs> I thought, what in the world is he calling me for? So I answered the phone, and sure enough, it was, it was all Morris uh, with his Alabama twang and, and, and his slow uh, drawl and he explained that uh, he had asked some of his uh, uh, inner circle members here in Kentucky, uh, Larry Franklin and, uh, uh, and others, if they would serve as local counsel in a Kentucky case that Morris and the Southern Poverty Law Center were wanting to file against the Imperial Clans of America and some of its leaders because that organization, that hate group, uh, this was the world headquarters for that, that organization. And he said, you know, my inner circle buddies wouldn't take the risk. They didn't want to wear bulletproof vests. They didn't want to have, have to worry about their families being assassinated and all this, that, and the other. And so, I listened to Morris and, and uh, said, well, what, what is it you, you need? What, what, what does this role entail? And he said, well, we do all the work. We just need a local attorney to, uh, you know, under the rules, you have to have a local attorney if out-of-state attorneys are coming in to handle something. And he said, uh, I'll be trying the case. And um, Richard Cohen, our president, uh, will do all the brief writing, and he's very good. He's argued cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, and and uh, so uh, I said, "Well, sure." I was honored, you know. I, whatever you guys need. Now, if Morris were sitting in this chair, he would tell you that as we got to working on the case, um, that uh, and he tells his story to to I think get a chuckle, but it, it's true. If you want me, and, and I, as much as I appreciate uh, Morris Dees and the work that these fellows do. I'm not always uh, easy to work with in the sense that I really am, am committed to doing things my way. Mm -hmm. And that didn't exactly go over so well it with Morris well. and Richard because mm -hmm. they, they, they both kid me that they looked at each other when we had our first conference call about any of the details of the case. And, and I was saying, well, I don't really think that's a good idea. I think you should do this. And, and I can be pretty dogmatic. They looked at each other like, who is this guy? <laughs> who is this hayseed up there in Kentucky telling us what to do? Uh, anyway, we... Uh, we got along just fine, and uh, uh, I was really looking forward to meeting him. And mm -hmm. so we, he was a voice on the phone and a character in a book uh, for the longest time, but he made arrangements to uh, have me flown down to Montgomery and uh, uh, get halfway there, and, and the airplane windshield uh, cracks. Literally halfway there, airplane windshield cracks, and this is in a small private plane that had been rented from out of Bowman Field. And the pilot says, we got to turn around. I said, wait a minute. It's just as, as close, that is, our destination is just to return. Yeah, but I don't think I'll have a windshield replacement down there. And I get it done in Louisville. So we had to go back. And I didn't and get And you did not have your parachute. Didn't, didn't, I, I wish I'd had my parachute, <laughs> uh, but I didn't. So we flew back to Louisville, and, and I never got to meet him on, on that occasion. That was the one of the boy that was beaten? Yeah, there, th this was a, a Meade County Fair. I think it was in the summer of 2005 that this uh, fellow, was, he was 16 years of age. He was wandering through the fair, uh, minding his own business, 
Uh, he certainly was a, a, a young man of color. Uh, he had uh, a Central American, native Central American uh, heritage, uh, and uh, but was living, growing up in Louisville, uh, and I forget the connection of how he wound up at the Meade County Fair that day, but uh, he was there, and there happened to be uh, some of the uh, leaders of the Imperial Clans of America that were at the Meade County Fair, which is common for members of those hate groups to pass cards out, uh, membership material, talk up joining the Imperial Clans of America. And so that's what these guys were doing at, at the fair that day when they see this, this boy. This and, brown boy. Yeah. And, and so to impress, I think, uh, others, uh, to make the point that, that you know, th th this is, you know, we have to take a stand against people of color. And, and so these guys went up to this kid and, and uh, uh, threw a beer in his face and uh, ultimately beat him up, got him on the ground, kicked him in the head with their steel-toed boots. Uh, he suffered brain injury. He suffered uh, uh, other injuries to his body and... Um, a teenager. Yeah, 16 years old. 16 years old. And a, a small 16-year-old fellow. Uh, not, not, not big. I mean, literally, I'm going to say he was five, five foot maybe at the time. Five, five foot two. Um, so these brave men. Yeah, these big, uh, big, bulky, uh, uh, fit uh, men uh, beat this uh, little fellow up in the presence of others. And arrests were made. And these, uh, these men wound up going to, to prison for what they did. And so we, that is Southern Poverty Law Center and myself, Morris, we filed this lawsuit against the Imperial Clans of America. Also, uh, Ron Edwards, the Imperial Wizard, uh, and a fellow named uh, Hensley, uh, who was kind of their enforcer. And, and uh, that was the, the nature of that case. And this was not a slam dunk. The, Morris's model was unique in this country. He would figure out a way to sue these organizations throughout the United States that were committing hate crimes. He would sue them on behalf of the victim, not charge any attorney's fees, obviously. All this work is pro bono. Uh, none of us get paid, nor do we have any expectation of being paid. Mm -hmm. But Morris would go out and sue these organizations and eventually wrestle them down and get all of their money. Mm -hmm. uh, take the, the, all their money, all their property, uh, and Bank put them out of business them. and bankrupt them and make mm -hmm. it, it difficult, if not impossible, for them to continue. But like all kinds of, of, of bad eggs, they continue to, to grow and flourish in other areas and they keep popping back up, which is why the Southern Poverty Law Center um, continues to serve such a tremendous role uh, in our nation uh, in fighting uh, hate crimes. But uh, this uh, particular organization had property down in western Kentucky, uh, near Dawson Springs, and it was sort of an enclave of, as I recall, about 17 acres. And they would have these annual meetings, uh, gatherings of, 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 of these uh, supremacist. Uh, supremacist groups, and they had a stage, and they would have rock bands, supremacist rock bands playing. And, we had video that was taken surreptitiously over the years by people that had infiltrated these organizations. And you just can't believe the, 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 the hate. You just can't believe the, the amount of hate that they uh, preach uh, at these uh, the gatherings, these annual meetings. Um, uh, they call them um, uh, festivals, but uh, it's far from festive in, in, in the way I see festivity. But w they would have these these uh, uh, knock down, beat up, fight things to, to show who's tough. And I mean, they were just, they're angry people. 
they are violent to the core. Uh, and, and so um, holding an, an organization accountable, uh, holding its, its, its leaders accountable, uh, and, and obviously the Imperial Wizard, he was down there in, in, in the Dawson Springs area the night that these thugs uh, were actually doing the, the beating up, Hensley, Jared Hensley mm -hmm. was, was there uh, uh, as one of the people that did the beating. He's the one that went to penitentiary. And, uh, uh, but the Imperial Wizard holding him accountable uh, when he wasn't directly there uh, was the, the real genius behind Morris Dees and Richard Cohen two of the greatest legal minds, uh, bar none. And, and so we went through, once we got a verdict, um, and that achievement is a story into itself, right. but once we got the verdict against uh, these fellas, uh, keeping it uh, when the law is, 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 has a very high hurdle to overcome holding someone accountable for the acts of another when that other person is not the scene. But we, we, we argued that we do this all the time. You hold the Kroger truck driver accountable if he's done something wrong, mm -hmm. if you uh, encourage uh, 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 an employee to, to engage in activity you know is gonna harm somebody, they should be held accountable. Mm -hmm. They had annual uh, festivals for many years leading up to the events of the beating of this young man in 2005. So they, they have had a foothold, a stronghold in Kentucky, uh, and they, can, they designated that to be their uh, uh, world headquarters. Dawson Springs. Dawson Springs. So th th these, this is uh, a group that has by the time the case comes to me in 2006, it's been going on for uh, 10 years anyway. So it, uh, it was uh, quite stunning when in 2008, as we approached the trial, which was in November of that year, the revelation that a book had just come out revealing an assassination attempt on Morris Dees' life that he was completely unaware of. I guess by today there are, there have been seven, eight people go to prison for attempting to assassinate Morris. So associating with Morris can be a dangerous thing. I mean, no doubt mm -hmm. about it. Uh, you get caught in that crossfire it, it, and it's real. Uh, it, it, it's ugly. But this book uh, tipped us off that uh, a fellow named Cale Kelly had been a, been a part of this organization, had uh, uh, been friends with the Imperial Wizard, and Cale apparently had um, been involved in an attempt to kill Morris Dees uh, and got so far as to actually uh, be stopped by the FBI as he was getting on a Greyhound bus to take a ride to where Morris was giving a speech. This was many years before 2008. Cale Kelly had just been released from prison. And Morris got a call that they just alert you when they have to. The FBI contacted Morris in 2008, said we're releasing a fellow that tried to kill you. We didn't tell you about it, but said we don't have to, and we don't generally. But we thought you ought to know now that he's out. Well, then this book comes out explaining this whole uh, attempt to assassinate uh, uh, Morris, and, and Cale was, was arrested uh, with the, the rifle. And you know, and he was ex-military and sharpshooter kind of guy. He was capable of carrying out this assassination. And 
during the trial of the case, of course, going into this, we knew that there were, that, that, that there, well, there were threats on, and there are constant threats on Morris's life, uh, Richard, the rest of the group. Uh, so we knew going into this trial, perhaps more than others that, that the Southern Poverty Law Center has been involved in, there was real concern. So we had, they had placed snipers, security people in the woods around where we were staying and near the, the courthouse, watching in every direction. Because of this uh, knowledge that we gained through this book, and we then interviewed uh, Kale Kelly. And Morris and I, by the time we tried this case, had a, a, an unusual working relationship. We were, we, we, we thought alike. We, we, there was just something really uncanny about it. Um, uh, uh, personal things that just were quirky that you do that too? Do you do that? Um, uh, one silly thing, he comes into my room and, and, and at, at the hotel one night between trial days and he said, what, what do you, did, did you take my, uh, uh, you know, uh, money and credit cards and stuff? And I said, what are you talking about, Morris? He said, well, right there. I said, well, that's mine. He said, no, you're, you mean you don't use a wallet either? I said, no, I don't use a wallet. I, I just take the bills and wrap them over the driver's license and a credit card, and I call it a day. And he says, I do that too. <laughs> so, but anyway, we got It was to, one thing to smile about in a very tense. Yeah, well, it was, you know, we, it was just interesting uh, as we began to discover that we have a lot in common um, uh, and we do things similarly uh, to accomplish our, our goals. But as a result, he had decided that he wanted me to take a larger role in this trial than he usually affords uh, local counsel. Remember, local counsel doesn't have any job to do other than sit there uh, and be the Kentucky lawyer uh, and let these out-of-state lawyers do what they do best, and they've been doing this for decades, right? Mm -hmm. So I was uh, uh, really excited and thrilled to have the opportunity to, to get heavily involved in the dynamics of the trial of this case. And Cale Kelly was a key component because Cale had attempted to kill Morris Dees. We wanted him to testify. When we learned who had asked him to carry out this assassination. And that was the Imperial Wizard many years before. So, obviously, the Imperial Clans of America had targeted Morris Dees for probably a decade or better, um, uh, wanting to stop his progress in shutting down these organizations around the country. So, uh, I met with, with, with Cale Kelly and, and learned that it, it was uh, the Imperial Wizard that had hired him. And I uh, tell us more about him. How does what was his um, reaction to you even coming to talk to him about this to bring him? You know, it's it is it's a good question. It's a good question, and I'm I'm sort of skirting it because I, I I've, I've not ever articulated this story to anyone because it's very very personal and very deep into the process of preparing this case for trial. Morris and I felt, as did Richard, that it was best that Morris not be involved in that detail of actual preparing him. So they, uh, their Southern Poverty Law Center's security people, this is during the trial, uh, make arrangements to bring uh, Cale Kelly into the area. They had him in a cabin out in the woods. And I was taken with uh, police and security and lots of guns to this remote location one dark night during this trial to, to interview Cale Kelly and see if he would actually be honest and tell the truth. 
the book did not describe what his motivation was or who had hired him or wanted Morris Dees dead. Morris did not know Cale Kelly, and so we really didn't know. But Morris was able to get him on the phone and secure his agreement to at least come down and be interviewed. So this night, driving in places, I don't, I don't know that area well, we, we, we drive through on a, on a dirt road at least a couple of miles uh, uh, through this forest until all of a sudden at the end there's this, this cabin. And so we didn't hold out any hope that this was going to lead to anything we could actually use in, in court because this fella is not a good communicator, quirky. Um, so when I walk in and I had not seen a picture of the fella, didn't have any, nobody had described him, I was immediately struck by what a, what a handsome, uh, fit, good-looking guy he was, and he had his girlfriend there, who was a very attractive uh, woman, um, and maybe fiancé, don't think wife, but uh, so it was, you know, this fellow's out of prison, hasn't been out very long, um, and it, it was surreal. So I began to talk to him about his involvement, what I knew from having read the book, and uh, uh, he was reluctant, and I spent quite a bit of time um, trying to connect with him. Because this is very delicate work. You 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 have to develop rapport to get cooperation especially when that cooperation means someone is going to take the stand and they're going to uh, 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 perhaps for once tell the truth and the truth is ugly and and it could mean his life would be in jeopardy so it went well I was uh, you know we, we developed some rapport I left hopeful the plan was uh, state police have him at the courthouse the next day to testify. So I go back to the room that night. It's late, and and I said, Morris, I, I think I think that this is is uh, it's a toss up. I mean, you're co counsel in this case, and we're going to introduce testimony that Cale Kelly was hired by the defendant in our case to murder you, and so we got to tie it to, to something relevant. And so Morris says, I assure you that when I put the Imperial Wizard on the stand and ask him if he preaches the gospel of hate, and if he's one of these uh, terrorist types, is he a violent man? He'll deny all that. And when he does, we'll impeach that testimony with K.O. Kelly. I said, okay, Morris. All right, well, you, well, so the next day, we get to the courthouse, Morris, Morris puts him on, and uh, uh, the Imperial Wizard, just a bizarre set of circumstances. He's got a bald head. On one side of his head is tattooed uh, uh, fuck Zog, Z-O-G, Zionist Occupied Government. You see, he believed that, that the government had been taken over by the Jews. Um, and so on this side of his head, he had tattooed fuck S-P-L-C, Southern Poverty Law Center, tattooed on his bald head. That's the kind of, of meanness that we're talking oh, about here. Audacious. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So we put the wizard on the stand. Morris cross-examines him, and, 
and he's talking about what a peace loving kind of guy you know he's not into this this you know any kind of hate and violence you know yes i'm a i i, I am the imperial wizard and i believe uh, uh th that we are the superior race etc cetera, etc cetera. but i don't you know we don't we don't promote violence which of course we all know is is not so well i then put kale kelly on the stand and he is very direct and and uh, i was concerned uh, as uh, uh, to whether the court would would find this to be uh, appropriate i was uh, but I felt like it was important to impeach his credibility that he had piece. attempted mm -hmm. to assassinate Morris Dees at the request of the wizard many years before, and uh, the court allowed it in. So that testimony came in. But what y y you have to understand is we, y you, you put 15 people in the jury box to watch the trial until it's over, and right before the jury goes out to deliberate, you remove three people, so only 12 go back and deliberate. And in Kentucky, it takes nine of the 12 to come up with a verdict. A majority of nine renders a verdict. When th those three were re released before they went back to deliberate, one of those three actually went out and joined the Imperial clans who were marching outside. Signed up. Who was an alternate, alternate juror. Right. And that report back to us was chilling, chilling. When the jury came back and awarded two and a half million dollars for this little fella, all things including the punitive damage award, it was not unanimous. It was nine to 12. Jared Hensley had gone to prison, had pled guilty, gone to prison for beating this little boy up. Yet, three people on that civil jury couldn't see that he was responsible civilly. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't agree on him being held accountable, even though he was the most accountable. And this is 2008. <laughs> Eight. Yes. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, it was... Uh, uh, quite a scene. I, I just, I couldn't believe it. When it came time to do in the closing argument the night before, I felt uh, some tension about, you, you just, you know, human beings are, have evolved to the, to the, the, to the place we are in, in this, in, in this world, because we are so good at judging other people's intentions. And so what we as humans do from the minute we're born is looking at others and judging their intentions. It's how we defend ourselves. It's how we make our way in this world. And some are better at it than others. And I was concerned with this panel. I didn't, I didn't get a good feeling. And, and I, was, I was concerned that this would be the first loss for Morris Dees, mm. Southern Property Law Center, in this business model. Not on my watch. It's not going to happen. So that night, I, I talked to Morris. You know, I said, I "Tell you what, why don't we, why don't we split up the closing argument? You you give the the, the first half of it, and and uh, you handle the liability issues. And since I put the plaintiff on the stand, and I put the medical." Uh, expert on the stand to talk about the brain injury and the neurological problems, etc. I'll argue the damages part of it, and he said, "Well, I think that's a great idea. If the judge will allow it, that'd be that'd be just fine." So, next morning, closing argument, court says, "Sure, you know, that's there's nothing wrong with that, as long as you don't say the same things." And it was an unusual procedure, uh, but I was I was. If we were going to lose, we we're going to lose with my hand in in this in this uh, in this fire. Um, I wasn't going to not fight to the bitter end to bring this panel of jurors around in a direction I didn't think they would come. So when I was preparing my closing argument, you know, you, you, the things that have happened to you 
that's the time when you, you, you lock yourself up in a, in, in, a, in a quiet room with no distractions and, and you reflect on the moments of the trial that, that had the greatest emotional impact. And then you, you pull from your experiences in, in your past uh, things that were meaningful to you as metaphor in, in the uh, presenting of any closing argument. At least this is how I do it. And, and so the first thing that came to mind to me was, wow, I remember now when, when I was in high school. I was a junior in high school at Paducah Tillman, and I was, uh, uh, played a, the, the role of the young lieutenant in South Pacific. And I was uh, asked, uh, uh, of course, in that role to sing the song that the young lieutenant sings called Carefully Taught. And so as a backdrop to my closing, I put this large blowed up, blown up picture of, of these children standing in front of a burning cross with their racist parents, you know, saluting and and these young kids standing there in this light of the fire off the, off the cross. And it was the eeriest, most disturbing uh, image. And I was concerned, this is really why we have racism today, is that we, we don't seem to block that, that, that carefully taught notion. And the song is, is, a, is, is a classic. You've got to be taught to hate okay. and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. You've got to be carefully taught of people whose eyes are oddly made, of people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be taught from year to year. You've got to be carefully taught. So using that experience uh, as a 16-year-old, and when I went through that musical, I thought, you know, I don't know really what value this would ever have for me in the future, but that moment, I, okay. I did seize upon that, and it, uh, yeah, I think it moved even more Steve's, that, uh, So uh, you, he didn't know what no, you No, he did not know what <laughs> I had planned to do, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, so. So you were more than a co-counsel in the typical sense. Right. For this big Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, ultimately, this case went uh, through the Kentucky Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court, and the verdict was upheld. Uh, and we were uh, then able to put that fire out down there in western Kentucky. Um, and uh, uh, what price did you pay in terms of defending that case? Were you threatened? Were you, was your life threatened? Were you well. Uh, you feel threatened? Yeah, you, you feel threatened, especially when uh, you start this business with the, the conversation that says essentially other lawyers that I know well didn't want to co-counsel with me because they fear uh, that these hate groups could retaliate and if they did, they're, 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 there's a risk of, of harm to you and your family. So yeah, there's, there's that sense. Um, and the trial was, was something. I mean, the, the, just the experience of getting in a bulletproof vehicle with armed security people with machine guns, and I'm not, I don't think about those kind of guns, but they intimidate me, uh, and having to take extreme precautions to get out of that vehicle and into the courthouse, every day to to be locked up in a hotel under an assumed name all of us under assumed names at a distant location that we have to drive many miles just to get to the courthouse every day and then back to our hotel at night to prepare and um and the the paranoia that is so appropriate when you are the southern poverty law center and you're actually taking on the Klan uh, is, is unlike anything the one can experience. So in, it sort in, of reminds me of uh, when I read about Thurgood Marshall and some of the cases that he took down in Florida. Oh, wow, Devil Mississippi, in the Grove. Devil in the Grove. That's a great book, my goodness. Yes, and you know, and, and not 
you know, you think about Thurgood Marshall and you know he's the first African American Supreme Court Justice, but what he did as an attorney. So many courage. people don't know what Thurgood Marshall did as a lawyer. Uh, and, and shamefully, I, I, I was unaware of that detail until I read Devil in the Grove. And Devil in the Grove completely woke me up to racism in a way I had never, ever felt it. And uh, to this day, and, and I only read it uh, just a, a few years ago, and it has just stuck with me that he could win these cases in Tennessee, these rape cases where, where he's got a, you know, African-American defendant and all the odds are against him that he could win these cases. What an incredible lawyer. I mean, it was just amazing. Well, that's what I thought yeah. about when, when, when you said that.